Good morning. Welcome to the Wolverine Caucus. I wish I could say that I, we're welcoming you to the sunny and tropical Wolverine Caucus today. However, we're promised that the heat will turn up in a few days. And of course, we have a wonderful speaker here today to talk about climate and solar and wind energy. So maybe together we'll figure out something that will improve our climate in Michigan, if that's possible. Uh, Representative Andrew Kandrivas was going to introduce our speaker today, but um, he is busy uh, at work in committee for the House of Representatives at this moment. So I get the pleasure of introducing our esteemed speaker. Mark Barto is director of the University of Michigan Energy Institute, uh, world renowned for its work. He is also the inaugural DTE, Energy Pro Professor of Advanced Energy Research. Uh, Dr. Barto brings extensive experience as a researcher and inventor, an academic leader and consultant for both the United States and international organizations. His research focuses on chemical reactions at solid surfaces and their applications in heterogeneous cat catalysis and energy processes. Um, that is an amazing amount of uh, research to do. And he was named the 2008 uh, 100 Engineers of the Modern Era recipient by the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. He is the recipient of numerous awards from ACS, AICHE, and other national and international catalysis societies. I am so honored that he took time to come and join us in Lansing today. Please ask lots of questions um, that I know we all have about climate and solar and wind energy. And also, he brought with him handouts today from the Energy Institute that will be very interesting. So please feel free to grab one if you haven't already uh, while you're here with us today. Without further ado, please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Mark Bartow. Try the microphone here. Thanks very much, Veronica. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, I'm a relative newcomer to Michigan. I've only been here about 18 months. Uh, I spent most of my career at the University of Delaware. Uh, you may know that as the place that stole Michigan's football helmet design fair and square. Uh, so. Uh, this is the only place I could go and not have to, to change football helmets. Uh, had a bit of an interesting time getting here today. If you've been listening to the radio, uh, the intersection of 14 and 23 is, had a, is closed due to a spill. So I came via Livonia, and I'm just glad to be here. I, I, I like to you know, explore Michigan uh, since I'm new here, but that wasn't quite my idea of the way to do it. So. Anyhow. Um, I have uh, about half the talk is sort of a, a fairly general overview of energy. I find when I talk to different groups that um, you know even even experts usually find something on one slide that's new to them, and uh, you know depending on your background, hopefully you'll you'll find find more. And then I wanted to, to tell you a little bit about the Energy Institute and what we're doing, and uh, things that I think are of particular relevance to uh, to Michigan, and. I'm happy to answer questions um, during and after, so feel free to interrupt or, or uh, ask lots of questions at, at the end. So uh, I will talk a little bit about renewable energies. I'll, I don't have any climate slides in, but I can uh, extemporize on that, um, and uh, we'll go from there. So this is a, a slide I like to start with. It's uh, from the late. Uh, Rick Smalley, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry uh, some years ago, he was the discoverer of buckyballs and decided to, to spend uh, the latter part of his career on larger societal problems. And this was his list a little over 10 years ago of humanity's top 10 problems for the next 50 years. And he put energy at the very top of the list. Um, and I, I think it's an important list for a couple of other reasons. 
the, the other things that it shows, water, food, environment, uh, poverty, population, blah, blah, okay. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't touch the screen, but now I know to keep my distance. Let's try it from here. Uh, and, and you could quibble about the, the order of importance of these. Can you see through me over there? Okay. And, and I'll always move the podium, too. That works. Um, but the point is, they're all interconnected. Uh, energy and our energy use is driven, as, as we'll see, by population, by standard of living. Uh, all sources of energy uh, in, have a footprint in our water use, our land use, you know, whether it's fossil fuels that we're extracting from the ground uh, or biofuels that, you know, require uh, arable land and, and, and water to grow. So I think it's, it's important to realize the connectivity between these important issues uh, and really the need, um, you know, as a society to, to take account of uh, all of them and uh, understand that we can't solve one without impacts on, on the other. So uh, this is a slide I've taken from, from Exxon Mobil uh, showing the world's energy consumption. And you can find similar information from other industries from the US uh, Energy Information Agency, from the International Energy Agency. So, I tend to pick the slides that have the, the most colorful graphics, and the, and the source is, is not particularly uh, important or unique here. Uh, but this shows you that the world's energy consumption in units of quadrillions of British thermal units. And one of the, the messages is just the scale of our energy consumption. You know, a quadrillion is a, a, a million billion. Uh, in, in other uh, Units, we, the world uses about 15 terawatt years of energy per year. A terawatt is a trillion watts. And, and these are just numbers that are, are mind-boggling. Even for, for technical people and engineers used to engineering notation with a 10 to the something in the exponent, uh, it, it's hard to wrap your mind around. One of the, the, the numbers that I like is uh, a cubic mile of oil. The world uses about a cubic mile of oil per year. Uh, you know, and I have... I can visualize the square mile footprint on the ground. I have a real hard time with that mile up in the air uh, of, of oil to, to complete the, the cube. And, and about a third of the world's energy uh, consumption is, is, is petroleum based. There are a couple of other important points to, to make from this slide. If I can point without uh, moving it forward. Um, the first is really the, the rapid increase of our consumption. Uh, in recent decades. I was born in the 1950s, and I, I looked at this slide a few weeks ago and realized, my golly, the world's energy consumption has gone up five times in my lifetime. Um, this is a younger crowd, so maybe it's only two or three in your lifetime. So I don't know. But, but you know, one of the, the things that I don't think people appreciate is that our impacts in terms of energy use and the environmental impacts are, are not incremental. We're talking about multiples of two or three or five over our lifetimes. Um, the other point is where um, we get this energy from, and you see the, the breakdown here, but you see that the yellow, green, and red bars essentially represent fossil fuels, and that is where our energy has largely come from uh, in the last um, 50 or 60 years, and will likely, so this is projecting out to 2040, will likely come from in the future. We would certainly like to have more carbon-free uh, sources, hydro, perhaps nuclear, other renewables, wind and solar. Uh, this is ExxonMobil's projection, and you might think because they're an oil company, they're undervaluing this, but I think you will, will find similar projections, and I'll show you some from, from other other sources. And again, just to try to, to put the, the, the scope and the scale in perspective, I've got some numbers here showing you comparison of, of the daily consumption uh, of fossil fuels by the U.S. and China as of a couple of years ago. So the U.S. 20 million barrels of oil per day, 60 billion cubic feet of, of natural gas, 30, 3 million tons of, of, of coal. 
China uses a similar amount of energy. They're actually using more than we are now in, in 2014. Uh, they have passed us as the world's largest importer of oil, um, but they don't have the, a lot of oil resources, uh, and, but they have a lot of coal. So while the total amount of, of fossil energy they use is, is similar, you can see the, the distribution of sources is, is different. And that certainly then matters uh, when it comes to the, the amount and the, and the nature of the emissions from the energy use. So that's a, a lot of fossil fuels. Um, I like this slide, which I've also stolen. Um, the sort of blue marble slide that says the way we produce and use energy today is not sustainable, a new direction is needed. And this comes not from the Friends of the Earth of the Sierra Club, but from the chief chemical engineer for Royal Dutch Shell. So I, I think, you know, the industry also is recognizing that uh, there's some serious challenges ahead in the way we produce and use energy. So, um, I give talks of, of various lengths from, you know, 20 minutes to three hour classroom lectures on energy challenges, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to hit some of the high points. Um, but what are our challenges? One is certainly scale, meeting the, the growing energy needs of the world, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, the growth, the greenhouse gas emissions, and the, the climate change and other environmental impacts associated with those. Again, water and land are part of the picture. And then the other challenge is, is doing effective things about this. And, and part of it is technology. And those of us uh, working in the sciences and engineering focus many of our efforts there. But there's no magic solution. Um, we need to, to recognize resource limits. We need to recognize the uh, impacts of, of the you know, investment decisions in economics, our existing infrastructure, the need for future infrastructure. Um, all have policy. And then the other wild card in this is human behavior. And people don't always respond uh, as you might think or hope. Uh, one of the things I'll talk about later is uh, a new energy survey that we've launched at the university. You may have seen, I think it, it came out last Tuesday or Wednesday. So you may have seen some of the, the stories in the, in the papers or, uh, or heard them on the radio. So let's start with the first one. Um, you saw those, those projections of the world's energy use. Basically, you can see uh, all of these projections, and, and they boil down to some very simple arithmetic. It's population times gross domestic product per capita times the energy required to produce a dollar of gross domestic product. And then if you wanted to, to estimate carbon on top of that, it would be the... the carbon per uh, unit of, of energy used. And so, you know, you'll see different projections. Most of the pictures are all the same, but it all boils down to that, that simple math. So basically what, what drives the increase of energy consumption is increasing population and increasing standard of living. And so if you look at the projections out, say, for the next 25 years, this is showing the, the first 40 years of, of the century. Again, this is an Exxon slide, but, but you can find it. Others pro projecting uh, the world's an annual average growth rate of GDP at about 2.8%, and you see then uh, the kind of, of increase in the, the world's gross domestic product over that period. Again, it's a product of, of population and increased standard of living. Now over here, they're showing you the energy required to do it. If we didn't get more energy efficient, both through the kinds of, of conservation and efficiencies, but also essentially more efficient economies, then you would expect the, the growth of our energy to follow this curve. And basically, as economies develop, uh, what you tend to see, and as technologies come online, you tend to see that they become more energy efficient. And, and uh, you can actually see the data for the U.S. I don't have it with me. Uh, over the past uh, 50 or more years, a steadily declining rate of energy consumption per, per dollar of GDP. But it's declines on the order of 1 or, or 2 percent. They're, they're not dramatic. So what that does is produce a, slow, a slower increase 
in the, the world's energy demand and the net savings here. And one of the messages is that's important. Efficiency is important. Saving is important, but we can't save our way to meeting the, the increased needs. And if you project this out to mid-century or beyond, depending on whose numbers you use about projections of growth rate and so forth, uh, you're looking at, at a doubling or, or uh, perhaps tripling or somewhere in between of the world's energy demand by the year 2100. Where is that going to occur? It's actually not going to occur in the developed world. So here are some data showing you the breakdown between the countries and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, of which the U.S. is a part. In 2007, the developed world consumed about half the world's energy, the developing world the other half. Over projections for that are maybe it'll go up a little, maybe it'll be flat, maybe it'll be down a little, but I think it's pretty clear that the energy consumption in the developing world uh, will go up. And these are the, the sorts of numbers that were buried in that previous plot. And again, it's a, a product of, of population growth. This is where populations are going to increase the most and increase standard of living. And certainly the rest of the world has the, the right to aspire to and work toward the kind of, of standard of living we enjoy. So this isn't meant to demonize uh, the developing world. And in fact, to the extent that we're offshoring manufacturing, we're actually in some ways displacing some of our energy consumption to the, the places that are making the goods. It's just a recognition of the kinds of, of, of drivers of energy consumption of the future. Now, you've seen the, the rise of, of the world's energy consumption over the past 50 or 60 years, five-fold increase. Most of it is fueled with fossil fuels. What do you get when you burn fossil fuels? You get CO2. So no surprise, the world's emissions of CO2 over this same period have increased five-fold. It's really, you know, pretty, pretty straightforward math. One question is where are we headed in the future? Uh, I've shown here various projections, again, from the U.S. Energy Information Agency, the International Energy Agency, uh, and the red line there. And, and that roughly is where you know, the kind of projections that I, I showed you earlier would, would fall. And those are probably leading us toward uh, atmospheric concentrations of, of CO2 by mid-century at about 550 parts per million, maybe as high as, as 600. Uh, now, depending on the assumptions that are made, so especially from the International Energy Agency, I, I've drawn some, some yellow bananas there, depending to, to try to show the range. But you see the, the trend uh, with, with most assumptions of what is likely to happen uh, is still upward. The, blue, or the green squares show you the, what's called the 450 ppm scenario, which is the emissions that would be required to keep the atmospheric concentrations below 450 ppm, and that roughly corresponds to a, a two degree average rise in, in, in global temperatures. And so you see this widening gap uh, over the, the coming decades uh, between uh, what's likely to happen and what would be needed to stabilize CO2. That certainly provides a, uh, an incentive for trying to develop and deploy carbon-free sources of energy. Um, we do have a, a significant problem of scale, though. So just to, to sort of summarize that, um, you know, to, to sort of... Uh, Paraphrase the, 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 the light beer commercial from a few years ago, tastes great, less filling. Our, what we need here is more energy but less CO2. Um, the world's going to need, by the end of the century, two to three times as much energy. We actually need to reduce our carbon emissions by about a factor of three from today. And so six to ten times less CO2 emitted per unit of energy consumed. And, you know, just think about that. If, if we double the... the, the uh, the world's energy consumption, and we were to supply everything in that increased amount from carbon-free sources from wind and solar, right, that would still only get us to about half of the, the CO2 intensity. We actually need to, to reduce from the levels that, that we're at now. So, you know, these, these are the kinds of daunting challenges that I think uh, we and our children and our children's <laughs> children will, will face. 
So what about uh, wind and solar? Um, since those were, were, were in the title. Uh, I'll show you some uh, international data first and then some uh, US data. Uh, this is showing you the global capacity for wind power uh, over, well, since 1996, and you see it's gone up a, a, a pretty dramatic curve. And you'll see the, the US data in, in a little bit. The, the problem is that it starts from a rather low level. So as I mentioned, the, the overall energy consumption of, of the world is in terawatts, trillions of watts. These are in units of gigawatts. So a thousand times smaller here. So you see, we're starting from a, a, a very small fraction uh, being generated by, by wind. And just to put that in perspective, uh, those yellow bananas that I showed on the previous slide, uh, the, the, the lower bound of those uh, were the International Energy Agency's projection for what they call their new po policy scenario. That would have wind supplying 8% of global electricity in 2035, and by my estimate, that would require us to increase our uh, wind capacity worldwide by about 25-fold. Solar, the climb is even steeper. Again, these are, are, are worldwide numbers, uh, and uh, you know that's uh, really a, a very dramatic rise. I think uh, there, there's plenty of well, well, there are limits to, to how much can be deployed. I think there, there's plenty of headroom there uh, for continued growth. Uh, again, looking at even fewer gigawatts being produced by solar when this starts out. And to produce about 4% of global electricity in 2035, we would need about uh, a 75-fold growth in, in capacity. So um, that's, that's a lot. You know, and one of the problems with, with wind and solar is, of course, the, the um, utilization factor. You know, as we know, the sun doesn't shine all the time, the wind doesn't blow all the time. So these capacity numbers are not generation numbers, and they have to be divided by factors of typically two or three or, 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 or four uh, if you want reasonable estimates of, of production. So this is to show you what we've done in the US. This is showing you the uh, new capacity that has been built. This is for wind in the US uh, since 1998. And you see it's a little bumpy, and I'll talk about why that is. But you see the, the basic trend line that more or less uh, marks or, or mimics the, the, the global numbers. And in fact, in, in 2012, as noted here from the, the uh, US Department of Energy, wind power was the largest source of new generation capacity uh, added to the grid, at least in terms of capacity additions. Again, recognizing that the utilization of, of uh, wind capacity is going to be probably lower than a, a fossil fuel plant. Why does this bounce around so much? So for those of you in government, and, and I point this out to students as well, this is a, a great example that policy matters. So down here you have production tax credit on, off, on, off, on, off. So investment responds to those things. Over here, well, we had a recession. We also had Congress, in some cases, uh, being late to renew the production tax credit and doing it retroactively. Uh, the production, I, the 2013 numbers on, aren't here yet. I think they'll be fairly substantial, in part because the production tax credit expired at the end of 2013 and has not yet been extended. So a lot of people were rushing to break ground on new wind projects before December 31st to, to take advantage of, of, of that. So, you know, the, the, the overall uh, trend line is, is, is upward, and it's upward substantially, but Imagine how much better we could do with consistent policies. Um, this is a, a slide from DOE. Uh, I won't show you solar capacity, but it's a, a good reminder that there's more involved than just new technology and new science and new inventions. So these are the targets, DOE's targets for their SunShot program. 
idea to, to reduce the cost of, of solar uh, down in the ballpark of a, a dollar per watt uh, actually installed from substantially higher levels in, in 2010. And I think that I, I saw a report out of DOE a couple of weeks ago where already about 60% of the way toward the, these are 2020 goals. But the other important message here is these, these different bars. The blue bars are the cost of the, the solar panels. So that's something that we might hope to, to influence by the kind of research that, that we're doing at the university, trying to create uh, new, more efficient materials for, for photovoltaics and things like that. But you see other things, the yellow here, the, the balance of systems, the rest of the hardware that's needed, the non-hardware balance of systems, the, the installation and labor costs and, and, and so forth. And so you realize to hit these, these targets needs not only new technology, but essentially uh, technologies that are, are less expensive to, to install. It's, it's not just, just about technology. But again, the good news is that uh, uh, significant progress is being made there, and, and we're well on the way toward the, the uh, 2020 targets. And, uh, you know, depending on who's, whose estimates uh, you look at uh, and, you know, what, what tax breaks and other things there are, uh, there's certainly, uh, we're approaching grid parity there for, for solar. So, um, the other point I wanted to make uh, is if you think about those things like wind and solar, um, they largely feed into electricity, nuclear as well. Our energy consumption for electricity generation is only about 40% of our total. This is where it comes from today, or at least as of a year or two ago. Um, from coal, that tends to be decreasing. Natural gas has been increasing with the uh, availability of shale gas. In the U.S., it's about 20% nuclear. But the other important point here in, is in red. We don't, by and large, burn oil to make electricity. And that's something you'd be surprised that, that, that uh, people don't realize. Hawaii and Puerto Rico are a little different. They're islands. That's still where they, they get the, the uh, energy resources to, to make electricity. Conversely, our transportation system is almost entirely, 93%, uh, fueled by petroleum. So we have really two virtually separate but very large energy infrastructures in this country and with very little overlap. And so one of the, the challenges going ahead is not just to, to make uh, the, energy, or the electricity side of, of the equation more renewable, but to figure out how to feed some of those renewables into, um, into the transportation sector. You know, there are kind of obvious ways to do it, like more electric vehicles, right, that would use electricity, but there are other ways that, that it can be accomplished as, as well. Um, but I, this is, a, a, I think, a, a very sort of simple distinction that helps you to understand our national energy policies, such as they are. Uh, you know, we can really divide the world into, into two parts. So this is a slide I took from uh, Steve Coonan when he was Undersecretary for Science in the Department of Energy a few years ago. And he said, we basically have two energy challenges. If we talk about energy security, and by the way, from our survey data, that's something that seems to be more important inside the beltway than out, but I uh, won't go into that. Um, you know, it's largely about a reliable and economical supply, mainly about liquid hydrocarbons for transportation, and, you know, the, the, the targets have been driven by reducing use, reducing imports. If we focus on greenhouse gas emissions, the focus has mainly been on CO2 from stationary sources, so uh, power manufacturing, and you see the, the target 17% reduction by 2020, 80% by 2050, again, to try to meet some of the, the climate goals. And then, of course, the, the changes that those will, will cause in supply, transmission, storage, and use, and uh, whatever we do to solve them. If you're in Washington, we need to talk about jobs, jobs, jobs as well. So create jobs in the process of, of this kind of transformation. 
So this leads to you know, a, a fairly simple strategy. Uh, this comes from the, the DOE Quadrennial Technology Review. It's now a few years old. But you see, again, the world divided into to two parts, stationary uh, uses of, of, of energy and transportation, problems that are related to supply, problems that are related to, to demand, uh, and then the, the, the target strategies within those, deploying clean electricity, wind and solar are part of that modernization of the grid, increased efficiency, deploying alternative, it says hydrocarbon fuels, alternative fuels, vehicle uh, electrification, and, and increased vehicle uh, efficiency. And from that template, it's not too hard to map an all of the above strategy onto that. Right? If you look at, for example, the different ways that we might power transportation, some of them feed into the strategy for having a, a wider uh, menu of alternative fuels, electrification of the vehicle fleet, um, certainly would involve uh, electricity, uh, but hydrogen to the extent we might produce it by electrolysis of water um, would also in, be, in a sense, a way to get crossover from electricity into transportation. Increased efficiency, there's still significant improvements being made in internal combustion engines. And if you look up here, where does the rest of it feed in? Gas, solar, wind, and hydro into clean electricity. Other technologies, batteries, uh, more efficient lighting, smart grids, more efficient buildings feeding into to this side of things. There's an, a new um, quadrennial energy um, review due out in 2015. And I, I think there's something missing from this one that I hope will be in the next one. And that is a third column that addresses the consequences of our energy use. That mapping all of these kinds of things that have been aimed at, at supply and demand issues to take into account climate and environment, greenhouse gas emissions, land and water use, the societal transformations both that will occur because of these, these uh, uh, issues going forward and that need to occur, and likewise, where we invest in infrastructure, both replacement of existing infrastructure and creating entirely new infrastructures. And while this is sort of mapped onto um, federal policy, I think especially uh, as we talk about uh, land and water use, um, societal issues, and decisions about infrastructure investment, there's certainly important roles uh, to, to play at the, at the state level as well. So. From, from there, I, I thought I would spend a, a few minutes telling you about what we're trying to do uh, at the University of Michigan. Uh, we can't solve all of this, but I think uh, we can make some important contributions. And because of the strength of the university and the faculty and students we have uh, and the, the strong ties uh, to, to industry and, and within the state and across the nation, uh, I think we really have an opportunity to make a, a national impact, and that's why I, I came here, uh, because I thought this was the, the, the kind of team that, that I wanted to lead. We have about 140 uh, faculty who are involved with the Energy Institute in one form or another, spanning across the university from law and, and social science and economics and policy to uh, natural resources and environment to, to science and, and engineering. Um, but even uh, a university as, as strong as, as, as Michigan, uh, I think, needs partnerships to maximize its impact. So I, I wanted to, to highlight some of our partnerships and some of our activities and show you the kinds of things that, that we're trying to do. And, and the handout gives you a synopsis of, of some of our focus areas and some of our partnerships. I think it's got our website on it. And we in, and certainly invite you to visit in person or, or, or on the web. And, uh, you know, one of the things you can do is, is on our website, uh, you can very easily search for faculty experts in different energy areas. So um, this is on the, the handouts. So I'll uh, go over it real quickly. You know, we're focusing, we have strengths in carbon-free energy sources, <coughs> wind and solar, nuclear as well. We have one of the top nuclear engineering departments in the country. Energy storage and utilization. 
uh, our efforts in energy storage around batteries are, are strong and, and growing uh, tremendously, and I'll talk about that. Of course, historical strengths in transportation and fuels, and, and uh, even though I'm an engineer, uh, I'm really putting strong emphasis and investment on policy and economics and societal impact. As I tell my engineering students, we may think we have all the answers, and we may, um, but if nobody's buying, it doesn't do any good. You haven't solved anything. Um, so this, this shows you uh, some of the things that we're doing in the, in the vehicle area. Uh, we lead the U.S.-China Clean Energy Research Center Clean Vehicle Consortium. This is funded by DOE, by the Chinese government, and by uh, industrial partners on both sides uh, of the, the Pacific. Um, the funding at the university is about five million a year, half from DOE, half from, from industry, from partners like Ford and uh, Delphi and Eaton, just to, to uh, name you know, some, some Michigan companies. Uh, but focusing on a number of areas related to advanced transportation, including uh, advanced batteries uh, and that will be necessary for vehicle electrification, advanced biofuels and improved engines, and combustion, uh, lightweight structures, and you may have seen that the university is part of the uh, lightweight manufacturing, uh, lightweight materials manufacturing initiative uh, that was just announced uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, vehicle grid integration, and again, uh, looking at, at analysis and systems and policy. Uh, another big effort that we're part of is the, the DOE battery hub. Uh, the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research. Uh, it's led by Argonne National Laboratories. Uh, Michigan is, is one of five university partners in that, uh, the only one outside of the state of Illinois. You see a number of other, other partners that are involved there. And I wanted to highlight this because of what, what we're working on. <clears throat> we're looking to advance battery technology both for transportation but also for grid storage. One of the problems with wind and solar is they're intermittent. And so if you're really going to, to integrate those effectively in the grid, into the grid, it's important to be able to, to store the energy when the sun does shine and the wind does blow, but you don't need all of, all of the power. Um, so two thrusts here on both uh, ideas for, for large-scale energy storage for the grid, uh, what are called flow batteries where most of the energy is stored in chemical reservoirs outside the actual uh, battery cell. So it's not fast response, but it's, it's massive response. And then beyond lithium ion for, for vehicles. And there's actually some crossover between these two things. The goal of Jay Caesar is batteries with five times the energy density at one-fifth the cost and at the prototype level within five years. Will we get there? I don't know. But, you know, even if we fall a little short of that, I think it, it has a potentially big impact on advancing these kinds of, of technologies. And you may have read uh, that we're starting a new battery user facility at the university. And the idea is to, to try to scale up new chemistries and new designs from the kind of, of laboratory scale, which usually involves testing at, say, the watch battery scale up to... Uh, the kinds of scale of, of the cells that go into a, a, a car. So this is about a $10 million project uh, funded in part by the Michigan Economic Development Corporation and with a substantial investment by Ford. Uh, and uh, we hope to, to have it open um, around the first of the year. The other piece of this will not just be the, the sort of production side of, you know, at, at small scale, but also the ability to, to do analysis and, and characterization, understand why and how these things work and how they fail. Um, some of the other projects we're involved in, you may have, have, over the past year, heard about the hydraulic fracturing in Michigan integrated assessment project that's being led at the university by the Graham Environmental Sustainability Institute. The, the uh, first um, phase of that had the report published in the fall and we're now in the planning stages for phase two, really trying to focus on specific areas related to hydraulic fracturing where we can at least do analyses and not make policy recommendations, but, but create information and options that the policymakers can utilize going forward. 
uh, and the, the exact details are still to be determined, but you can imagine being in, in Michigan, water is a pretty safe bet to be a, a significant part of that. One of the things we've launched in the Energy Institute is a, a project looking at options for Michigan's renewable portfolio standard. Uh, I know this was a, a hot button issue in the last election, uh, and some of the, the information coming from both sides wasn't all that great. And so our thinking is to actually do the analysis uh, and, uh, you know, perhaps put some information out there before this comes up again, as it will, uh, to, uh, yeah. They're testifying at 1 o'clock. <laughs> Okay. Well, we're not that far along on this yet, but I'll be interested to see what comes out of it. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things coming to Michigan at about the time the election was occurring and, and seeing this and, you know, one, the debate was disappointing, but two, the, the fact that I think the University of Michigan was kind of missing in action as a source of, of information. Yeah, and, and, and maybe that was a good thing, but we're, 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 we're going to take a different approach this time around. Um, the Michigan Mobility Transformation Center, I think the regions just approved the, the test facility or test track for that. Uh, it's about automated and connected vehicles. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Our energy survey and our global challenges proposal. Um, so this, this is uh, the, the slide. The idea is to create uh, a public-private partnership with... Uh, significant vehicle automation, at least in, in Ann Arbor, uh, by the early part of, of the next decade. And there are important legal and technological issues to that. There are important energy implications. Now, if you look at uh, what connected vehicles, automated vehicles might do, from an energy emissions standpoint, everything looks like a win. If, you know, we have fewer collisions, we don't have to drive tanks, we can lightweight the vehicles, we can get better gas mileage, uh, you know, we can, can route around congestion and so forth, uh, but if people are, are letting their computers drive their cars, maybe they're willing to spend a lot more time in their cars. So, you know, the, all of the, the sort of technology wins could be negated by human behavior that dramatically increases vehicle miles traveled, and so we need to think about that from the get-go. Uh, you may have, have seen the reports on our, our energy survey. We've done this in collaboration with the Institute ah, for Social Research um, and grafted it onto their survey of consumer attitudes. The energy survey is a, a quarterly survey. Uh, we've got the, the initial results back from October. Uh, the message is people are more concerned about affordability and impact on the environment than they are about uh, reliability by about a factor of two. Um, and the other surprising result were their perceptions of affordability. The numbers that came back from October were that it would take about a 175% increase in your home energy bill on average for people to regard that as unaffordable, but a 75% increase in the cost of gasoline. That sounds like there's more elasticity there than I think most of us would, would expect. Um, We've got the data from January. We haven't analyzed that yet. It will be very interesting to see if people's worries about reliability, when there have been some natural gas and propane shortages, you know, when, when their winter heating bills have gone way up, you know, how, how these perceptions are different in January than they are in October. But I think that's the kind of, of information, again, that, that uh, we need to, to figure out strategies and solutions. Uh, lastly, uh, we're part of a, a University of Michigan Global Challenges project. Uh, we've completed the first year of a seed program and have applied for uh, additional funding at about an order of magnitude more. It's called Refreshing, Researching Fresh Solutions to the Energy, Water, Food Challenge in Resource-Constrained Environments. And it has two components. Uh, one is, is looking at sort of areas of the developing world where there are potentially low-tech solutions uh, to some of, of the energy and food and, and water needs there, but also looking at ways to do what's called reverse innovation and bring some of those back to 
uh, areas in, in the U.S. where they can be deployed and perhaps create manufacturing opportunities. So some of the partners we've been working with are Gabon in Africa, Kazakhstan in, in Asia, but the city of Highland Park uh, outside Detroit. And, and uh, we engaged there looking uh, at potentially repurposing, uh, you know, factories for things like um, food generation uh, in, in urban food deserts and also for looking at, at water consumption and ways to make uh, cities like that water, water neutral going forward. So I've probably talked too long. Uh, again, I want to in invite you to visit us in person if you wish. This is our home. Uh, that's our virtual home on the web. You'll find lots of resources there. We held a big energy symposium with national speakers in the fall. You can find the the clips of those talks there. Uh, and we've got something going on all the time. This is, are some events coming up in the next three months, including a, a, a symposium in Washington, D.C. Uh, on the impact of shale gas on U.S. manufacturing this Friday, uh, working with the Alliance to Save Energy uh, on an event, a uh, workshop on env energy environmental uh, implications of automated transportation coming up next month and then the Michigan Energy Futures 2.0 conference, and that's just sort of what's on, on the near-term horizon. So uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of activity, uh, have a great team of people, and, and I'm really proud to be part of, of a tremendous university here in Michigan. So thank you very much. What's your uh, funding sources? Primarily federal? For, for the research, uh, it, it's, it's, yeah, I think university-wide, it's primarily federal. Well, so the, the main program that, that we oversee directly is the CERC, uh, the, the Clean Energy Research Center, and that's, that's DOE-funded. Uh, but as I said, about half of that is, is funding by industrial partners. And if you look at, at other energy-related programs that uh, we're working with, but but aren't directly administered uh, through through the institute. Uh, you know, there, there's uh, we have an Energy Frontier Research Center on solar and thermoelectric materials uh, that's funded by the DOE, uh, but also has some industrial participation. So so it's a mix, and then base budget provided by the university. Other questions? Yes. <laughs> um, so DOE or DTE Energy has endowed the, the chair that I hold. We have a number of endowed professorships at the university, um, but there there are no strings attached. So <laughs> as far as, as you know, to me, so you know, I, I give them an annual report, uh, meet with them. Uh, they have been been helpful in supplying data for us. So one of the things we asked for um, was the ability to get uh, information that's not available to the public uh, on the energy generation sort of hour by hour from the solar arrays that we have on campus up on Plymouth Road and, and, and things like that. So, so uh, it's, uh, you know, nice support provides me some discretionary research funds no obligations, but I think it also provides us uh, an open door there that ha has been very helpful. But yes. I'm glad you showed us that slide about policy matters because I was noticing that it seems to me like, especially in the mid 2000s and certainly when the recession started, they had a lot of the uh, credits and sets for energy development. It just seems to me that we've been talking about this for a very, very long time and especially for the renewable energy pieces. And it, I guess it's sort of, I keep wondering at what point do we not need to have so much government funding and encouragement to, in order to make these um, work on their own? I, mean, do you, I know it's kind of a broad yeah. question, but I'm wondering if you have a guidance on that. Um. You know, I don't think there's one answer. I think it depends on, on the, the technology, and it also depends on the, the location. Um, so certainly onshore wind is economically competitive today. Certainly with, I mean, nobody's building new coal plants. 
you know, you may build natural gas in, in, instead. Um, you know, at, at what point, would I have pulled the production tax credit off just yet? No, but, you know, you can see the day not too far out when maybe you want to do that. Uh, you know, a lot of, of what's happening is at the state level. You know, uh, Michigan's renewable portfolio standard, to be blunt, is kind of weak. Uh, you know, if you look at, at what California is doing, uh, they have much more robust requirements. They have uh, actually now requirements for the utilities to start um, putting in storage capacity. Um, they have they've restructured the, the you know, the sort of profit model of the utilities, the sort of decoupling between the amount you sell and the, the, the amount that you make. So, you know, the, the, there are lots of ways to skin the cat besides subsidies and tax credits, and some of them may work better at, at the state and, and local level than at, at the federal level. So. Yes? Sure. Geochemists are talking about how we're at this level already of 400 that we may push uh, the global system to release of methane. Methane is going to be much more serious if you can talk about yeah. methane releases for the yeah. Well, let, let, let me say one thing first. Is I, you know, I, I think, I think we're going to blow right past 400 ppm of CO2, um, and um, while I wish that weren't the case, the question is, we, we've, we've got to slow things down first before we throw throw the the transmission in reverse. Um, the, the methane issue is is an important one, and I think it's underappreciated. Um, Part of the challenge is figuring out what the impact on global warming is. So uh, it sort of depends on the length of time that you think things stay in the atmosphere. Um, so if, you, if you're looking at 100-year impacts of, of methane, it's maybe 10 times worse than CO2. But if you're looking at near term, it, it, it's actually much worse because it's got a, a shorter residence time. Uh, if, you, if you base it on a 20-year analysis, uh, currently, I just saw this number at a, a DOE, uh, ARPA-E workshop about a month ago, uh, not quite a third of our global warming potential of emissions uh, is, is actually methane. Um, and that comes from different sources. You know, there's been a lot of, of uh, question about whether or not we are accounting for emissions from, well, from, from production. Now, you know, there's no reason that a, a well that involves hydraulic fracturing should necessarily be worse than, you know, the, the, the more traditional forms of, of, of uh, oil and gas production. So there's a lot of sort of new understanding that gets thrown on the shoulders of fracking. And it's not fracking per se, it's, it's you know, production of, of oil and gas from the ground. Um, you know, there, there are leaky pipes. One of the things that, that I question is the current drive uh, toward uh, na compressed natural gas fuel passenger vehicles. I think it makes sense for heavy duty vehicles. It makes, may make some sense for fleet vehicles. If you think about everybody fueling their car in their garage from a, a natural gas compressor, you've just created 50 to 200 million more point sources of methane. I just, I don't see that as a win, unless we do a heck of a lot better job, um, you know, stopping that than we did with, you know, plugging leaky gas tanks that had MTBE in them. We tend not to address those kinds of problems very well. Another piece of it is there's a surprising fraction of the methane emissions that comes from uh, from livestock. You know, so I may do a lot. I drive a hybrid. I gave up my sports car to be greener. I'm not going to give up my T-bone. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but 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 that's part of the equation too. Uh, but but yeah, I think. Uh, 
as we see this, this boom in natural gas, we need to think very carefully about where the real winds are from a, a climate perspective. Certainly displacing coal for, for power generation, no question about that. Uh, yeah. Mainly, uh, wind and solar energy. How do you think that those increases are going to pull from the production market share of the energy going to plants and agriculture? If that is oh, um, yeah. I people ask have asked me that question in various forms. I, I think. Well, just to give you one example, if we. Uh, covered every roof in the U.S. with solar cells, I think we could, could uh, generate about 10% um, of our electricity needs. Um, you know, and the sun is already falling on those roofs, they're absorbing energy. So, you know, in, in many cases it's, uh, um, you know, it's thermal energy being pulled out of the system one way or the other. So I, I, I really don't see that as significant. I've, I've heard arguments about, um, you know, changes in patterns downstream of wind farms and affecting uh, weather. Um, I haven't looked at it very carefully. I, again, the scale of most of these things just, just isn't that big enough. I had a question at a talk I gave a few weeks ago about someone worried about uh, all of the solar arrays in Arizona sucking so much energy out of the atmosphere that that's what caused the polar vortex to go south and that's why we've had a cold winter. I don't think so. <laughs> um, you know, so, so again, if, if, if you look at the amount of energy that's being deposited uh, on, on the Earth uh, already uh, from the sun, we're, we're really not talking about extracting all, all that much. Yeah. Uh, with all the effort being exerted currently in Michigan energy policy as well as the current energy policy, uh, what do you think that square against the forecast um, yeah, well, I, I, that's a good question. In, in, uh, you know, I think if China were to, to sort of build things like that willy-nilly, um, you know, they're, they're, let's face it, we have one atmosphere collecting the yeah. CO2. The, the, yes, there's, the, there's limits to how much impact we can make. I'm actually on the board of the National Institute of Clean and Low Carbon Energy in Beijing, which is funded, ironically, by the Shenhua Group, which is one of the world's largest coal companies. Uh, <laughs> but at least they're, you know, willing to fund things in clean energy. They, you know, they're interested in, in cleaner uses of, of, of coal. Um, you know, th their projections for the increase of coal use in China at least their numbers are, are pretty daunting. I mean, like, you know, three or four times as much used in the next 40 years as they've used in the last 60. Um, you know, their drivers for that, one is, you know, as, as I pointed out, they don't have a lot of oil. So they'd like to turn coal into transportation fuels as well. Uh, what's pushing against that, of course, uh, it's not climate, but, but, you know, environment, air pollution. Uh, and yes, yeah, and, and so, um, so then is that going to push them in other directions? Uh, Are you seeing that that, that that issue is perversely influencing policy decisions that are made here? I mean, why would we care about uh, a state level policy in the face of such huge issues? <sighs> well, yeah. I'm hearing, why would we want a progressive energy code in our building when China's going to build 1,200 coal fired buildings? Well. Particularly if it would affect our economic viability. And so we, we, we figure ourselves for, for no good reason. That's the argument. Well, sure. And, and you know, I think one offs don't do much good. You know, Australia put on a, a, a carbon tax, and nobody else did it, and, and it hurt Australian manufacturing. So the, the, the participation has to be broader. It may not have to, 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 to be worldwide. Uh, you know, as you were saying that, I, I was thinking of an old Tom Lehrer song. Um, 
you know, about it, it was related to, you know, nuclear Armageddon, but the, the catch line was, we'll all fry together when we fry. Uh, so I, you know, I think we have to, to do something. I would argue, you know, we can't control the Chinese policy, but we can do things that in some ways incentivize the wrong things there. And that's already happening. You know, as natural gas has displaced coal, we're exporting coal to, to China, to Europe. Uh, you know, another question, and, and I haven't even gotten into uh, oil sands and Keystone XL, and if you want to stay for another half, half an hour, I'll be happy to talk about that. You know, the piles of pet coke that we're, we're making. Should we be burning that? Should we, we be exporting it? On the other hand, if we're trying to, to sequester CO2, if you got piles of carbon on the ground, it would be a heck of a lot easier to lock it up in that state than trying to pull CO2 out of a, out of a, uh, you know, a, a power plant stack. So to the extent that we're feeding other people's use of, of dirty energy resources because we have cleaner ones now because of the shale gas revolution. So. Finger in the yeah. With the water flowing over the dam, and that's concerning to me. I don't know if you're seeing that in your work, but I'm seeing it. Uh, well, so I, I showed you the numbers from the energy survey, and when, when, but the, you know, the public perception about what the key environmental issues are, um, the big one is air, air quality. So climate is somewhat further down the down the list. Uh, so I don't think there, I don't think there is the, the sense of public urgency that might might drive policy yet. But that's why I go out and give talks like this. What do you see as the relative uh, competitiveness of new energy sources versus energy conservation, uh, particularly like residential? Sure. Uh, look, you know. Conservation is always the winner. That's the, the low-hanging fruit. And, you know, the, the uh, McKinsey group did a, it's a famous plot that they published about 2007, sort of showing you the, you know, per uh, gigaton of CO2 that you're trying to, to abate, you know, the cost of doing that. And, the, you know, the first third of the plot, about a third of what we need to do, could be accomplished by efficiency measures at effectively negative cost. Both consumers energy and DTE have these low energy programs. Are they being heavily used? I, you know, I, I don't know that. Um, yeah. Well, and part of the, but you know, but that comes back, that comes back to financing, right? It, the payback time may be short, but if the consumer has a big capital cost up front, versus you know payback that's extended over time, and again, depending on, I mean, we do find some of these responses uh, to the survey varying by income level and and you know housing level and, and things like that. Um, you know, people make, make different choices. But one of the challenges with, with the efficiency is it is distributed, right? It's individuals making those choices, not centralized choices that are affecting thousands or, or, or millions. And so it's, it's, it's a little harder to, to push that rope, if you want to think of it that way. Yeah. Good. Please join me in thanking our esteemed professor today. You know, when we when we think about all of the the changes in our world, and the fact that uh, when we plan these forums, sometimes six months or a year ahead of time. 
um, not knowing um, the synchronicity that will happen, uh, the fact that there's a hearing today, um, who could have predicted that a year ago when we planned this forum? But that just speaks to uh, the importance of this topic and um, the masterful way in which you present it. So thank you, Dr. Bartow. And on behalf of the um, University of Michigan Alumni Association and the Office of the Vice President for Government Relations, I wanted to give you this 14 Garrett Gold pen of our esteem. Oh, thank you. It's a lapel That's pen, Wolverine Caucus. So thank you again. And That's um, much nicer than the one I got from <laughs> government, government relations <laughs> people. <laughs> And also, just wanted to mention, um, we always appreciate your presence here. These forums are generously uh, provided to us by the Office of the Vice President for Government Relations and uh, the Alumni Association. And we're pleased that we were joined today by Representative Rick Olson and Representative Gretchen Driscoll. Um, also, Ben Ike here from Rep. Joseph Graves' office, and uh, Executive Director Jeff Mason from the University Research Corridor. So thank you for joining us today as well. Uh, Jenny Geis here from Rep. John Spotowski's office, and Brian Merlos, uh, Rep. Gretchen Driscoll's office. So again, just thank you for your time today. And speaking of uh, smart technologies, uh, we hope you will join us again on April 20. 9th, that's Tuesday, April 29th, when we will talk about smart cars and driverless vehicles, which I know you'll all want to run out and get one of. <laughs> as <soon> as <laughs> so again, thank you for today, and if you would like the PowerPoint from today's presentation, please let us know. Thank you.